Hello there, uh, just a quick book related note before the video. Now the news cycle is currently dominated by stuff relating to Donald Trump having the coronavirus, whereas a lot less is being said about the almost 20,000 workers for Amazon who've uh, been tested positive for COVID-19. And uh, you know, the president is obviously gonna get all the care and state-of-the-art treatment and round-the-clock vigilance that anybody with this uh, condition deserves, whereas much less can be said for the workers who have to rely on America's pretty shoddy healthcare system. So uh, regardless of whether or not you think this represents gross negligence on the part of Amazon, and uh, regardless of what your thoughts are on Amazon as a company in general, uh, you know, regarding its uh, tax dodging and uh, forcing small booksellers to close, the fact that it exploits its workers and is profiting massively off this pandemic, putting all that stuff aside, uh, now there's pretty um, concrete evidence that if you buy a book off Amazon, you could be putting someone's life in danger. So basically what I'm saying is there's so many other ways that we know we can get reading material. Uh, don't buy from Amazon. Uh, with that out of the way, on to the video. I was recently tagged by Alex from What Page Are You On to do the Your Favorite Fiction tag. I think that's what it was called. Um, but it was a book tag and it has to be your favorite books and it had a lot of rules and one of the rules was it has to be something from the 21st century. So immediately I just knew this was going to be not like a challenge for me but basically impossible for me because this is a huge brutal gap in my reading is contemporary writing and um, especially stuff in the last 20 years as I found out because I, I, did, I did decide to make a video obviously because I thought about this a lot and I realized on thinking about it that when I was a kid, like through the 90s, I did read fantasy and stuff as it was coming out and loved loads of those things. But almost exactly around the millennium, I stopped doing that. And I'm not sure why, but I guess, you know, like my family moved house is one thing. So we, I stopped going to the library so much and my read it, reading habits changed, I guess, just as they do when you get older. I kind of fell out of love with fantasy and for whatever reason, I stopped basically reading contemporary fiction. And I have tried to amend that basically starting from this year, as you might know if you've seen some of my previous videos on this channel, although I haven't found anything yet which I really absolutely loved, unfortunately. There are exceptions, of course. And um, to begin with, I'm not thinking about uh, translated stuff that was, you know, for example, The Diving Pool I really loved by uh, Yoko Ogawa. That was like a collection of three really freaky uh, novellas. And that was published in the 21st century, but it was originally published quite a bit earlier, I think, um, in, in Japanese. So I'm not kind of thinking of those things. But there were a few things that I realized that stood out that were books that, I, that really made a big impact on me. There's Coraline, which was written in 2002 uh, by Neil Gaiman, sort of Alice in Wonderland um, story about a girl who finds a door in her new house and goes into a weird parallel world. And yeah, I really loved that story. It made me super into uh, Neil Gaiman. Also spooky, also 2002, was the Japanese manga Gyo. And then sometime later it was translated into English. Uh, but yeah, that is about um, some fish that start appearing on land because they've like seem to have developed little insect-like legs and they're scuttling around. And so it goes from that weird event to this sort of fever dream of a apocalypse situation and just watching the world deteriorate um, in Ito Junji's inimitable, inimitable style is, uh, was really great. I love that book. Also, probably the most pungent book I've ever read, uh, next to Perfume by Patrick Suskind. But I can't mention that because that, of course, is much older. Then in 2004, After Dark by Haruki Murakami, probably my favorite Murakami book. It's just uh, a night, it's a short novella, and it's like one night in Tokyo. All these characters walking around, talking about jazz, doing Murakami things. I like it because it's got the magical realism feeling to it, but it never goes quite into the talking cats territory. So it's uh, it's got a real kind of subtlety um, that I don't that is sort of missing, I think, from a lot of his stuff, as well as uh, interesting and realistic female characters, which you don't see really that much in his work either. Um, and then, oh yeah, 2011, Seeing Stars by Simon Armitage, one of my favorite poetry collections ever. So lots of stuff actually um, that I read that made a big impression on me and that I really loved, but none of those I would say would be like an all-time favorite 
book, you know, just stuff that I like. Now I'm probably forgetting a bit. There's probably, you know, stuff that I didn't put on my Goodreads and it's just escaped my memory. But basically, with the knowledge I have, if I cast my mind back, there's basically one book, one book only, which was written in the 21st century and which I would consider one of my absolute all-time favorite books. One of those books that, you know, if you just look at it, you feel good. If you open it at any time and to any page, just reading one page will sort of make you feel like your day is better. Those are, for me, like the absolute favorite books. Those are the kind of things that I think about when I think of favorite books. And there is one of them, only one, that was written in the 21st century. And that book is This Is Not My Hat. I imagine some people clicked away just now because they realized the rest of this video is going to be me talking about a children's book. But that's good because we don't need them. You know, you're still here. We're still about to talk about one of the best books ever written. So, you know, it's it's fine. It's good. You know, we, we gather closer, fill in the fill in the gaps that they that they left when they when they parted from our imaginary circle of friends. And listen, as I tell you about why this is not my hat is so good. Now, I said before, I think, on this channel that I really like books that can do a lot with a little, by which I mean, the, you know, they can invite conversation and they pose questions. Um, they hint at things which aren't on the page. They, you know, make friends gather and discuss things and like have their own take on stuff and to do all this in as few words as possible. And that is one of the huge triumphs of this book. Now, I think John Classen did a wonderful job with his book prior to this one, um, I Want My Hat Back. I Want My Hat Back is also brilliant. It's about a bear. He wakes up, he's lost his hat. He goes around asking people um, and animals, I should say, um, to if, they, if they've seen it and he's describing it. And it's actually really good. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that because it's with the second book, This Is Not My Hat, that John Classen reveals himself as the Dostoevsky of children's literature. This is a story about a fish who has stolen a hat. It begins with a fish speaking to us, the reader, saying, this is not my hat, I took it, and I know that's wrong, but to be honest, it looks better on me than it did on that other fish, and I'm just gonna take it. And there's a safe place, I know, and if I get to there, I'll be fine, and no one will ever hear about me again, so I'm just taking his hat. And um, it, it says that, obviously, in just like a few words, not in the long, you know, mangled version that I just gave. It's, it's, it's great, it's poetry. So this is all done in very simple speech and simple pictures, and it introduces the question, um, you know, obviously it's aimed at children, about uh, ethics, you know, like, are we rooting for this fish? Do we want him to succeed? He's kind of, it's, 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 he's interesting, he's honest, he's kind of a funny character because of his self-justifications. Um, we know what he's done is wrong, but um, how do we want this story to go? Do we want him to, you know, like, be punished? You know, he's done a bad thing. Does that make him a bad fish, right? These are all things which are instantly planted in your mind and which will continue to stay in your mind without having clear resolutions all the way through this book. Like in any picture book, the illustrations are a huge part of what makes it work. Um, so, like, the style is wonderful. The, the Having the water black is, I think, fantastic. Black is, like emptiness it's like the abyss it's got like it's a little bit scary but also it kind of you know takes away um the idea of of a background space if that makes sense and background kind of like highlights almost the colorful uh, shapes of the things in the foreground whether it's like the fish or the rock or the the, the seaweed or a crab or whatever um but it also kind of puts them in the void, you know, like in this empty nothingness space. Like, like it reminds me of these um, ukiyo-e, like old watercolor paintings that you get in Japan and, and also in China as well. They had like these watercolor paintings where, um, unlike the Western style, where you have to fill in the whole background, they just leave loads of empty spaces to imply stuff beyond the main uh, focal points of the image. Also the blackness, you know, it evokes shadow, but also, you know, despair, the pit unease it's it fits well with the story which is about theft and um a moral dilemma let's say but the thing that's probably most important about the illustrations and the way they make it work so well is the way that they depict a world at odds with the fish's world so the fish is talking about how you know he's fine he's you know he's safe um the other fish is sleeping anyway the, as he's saying this the image that we see is the other fish waking up so this is like funny, but also it's really interesting because it creates like the physical world of the, the pages and the, the pictures and these like bright vivid colors and the dark background and all that. 
um, as contrasted to an inner world, which is the thief fish, right? His way of speaking and his idea is that he's not being insincere or anything like that, but everything he says is completely contradicted by the reality. So he's, you know, obviously deluded. The fact that he's not lying to us, that he's sort of taking us into his confidence makes us admire him. And there's this wonderful tension that's built between his inner world and his dialogue with us and then the outer world that we can see, you know, that the image is on the page. And as, you know, the pursuit begins um, that he's unaware of, we get this building tension where we know that his inner world of, you know, like, I stole the hat, but I'm a good person and I'm fine and I'm going to get away with it. And then the outer world, which is, you know, presumably some kind of either justice or retribution, we don't know yet. But what, for whatever, the inner world and the outer world are going to collide and it's going to be violent. And that, like, keeps us going throughout this story. To be honest, like, something this sophisticated that can be communicated in such a basic level to very, very young children is just to me astounding, you know? They're not using all the words that I'm using now to describe all this. It's done in very simple sentences and very simple pictures, and yet that is the impression that's created. Also, like, to do with the idea of perspective, I think a key thing is that what we as readers cannot see becomes important. John Classen has a double page spread of the weeds, you know, what the fish thought was his, like, his safe space, his way that, his way out of, of his crime. And, like, it's, that's the moment of violence, the moment of everything coming together, and all we get to see is the weeds. We're never left to know exactly what happened. There's this great ambiguity, um, and then you see the aftermath. The way he manages to make the reader look at these weeds as though we're looking for an answer, we're looking to see that, that moment of what happens when the inner world of the thief clashes with the brutal reality of, of, the, of the pictures and the images that we've seen, we're left looking and we don't know and it's ambiguous. And I think it's just a breathtaking moment. Um, it is for me anyways. The fact that the book invites you to use your imagination at the height of its power, you know, the, the big moment where it does the thing that it's been promising, it puts in your own head rather than on the page. And for a picture book, a picture book which is supposed to show you pictures, um, I think that's, yeah, I think it's just brilliant. It's amazing. I think one of the main things as well about this is like how it invites you to sympathize with the fish, you know, like in some ways we do think, well, yeah, the hat did look better on him, you know, and like he's, he seems like a fun character and, you know, it makes you ask, you know, what should be punishments for these kind of crimes and like do, do, do all crimes deserve punishments? And I think like depending on your own sense of morality, the text will make you have different questions. Um, I think that's clear because I, I, I recently read a, a blog post about it and the ideas were really different. I'm going to leave a link to it below because there were some really interesting ideas that I had never really considered, like about the character of the crab, for example. Like I see it very much just about the little fish, but this person who wrote the blog um, saw it, it really as a three-person story with the big fish, the little fish, and the crab. Um, but yeah, like I'll leave the link below. Fascinating stuff. Um, and yeah, I think the point is just that Different people will take away different things from something which is done so simply and so purely that I'm just left in awe when I think about it. I really wish I had my own copy. I wish I had my own copy of this book. It would be great. Um, but I don't. So I hope you enjoyed listening to me rave on about my favorite children's book and my favorite book of the 21st century. Um, I hope that I will get many more favorite books of the 21st century as I continue this booktube journey which I started this year and as I read more and more stuff which has been published um, recently. I am pretty confident that I'm going to get some more all-time favorite 21st century books, um, fictional books I should say, uh, on my on my list, in my heart, wherever. I'm going to get them and I'm going to love them and it's going to happen but it hasn't happened yet. So please leave your recommendations for me because yeah, um, masterpiece as this is not my hat is i do need other books i think that were written more recently that to completely blow my mind uh, just to you know broaden my my reading horizons by the way yeah as you can see i cut my hair um second time in my life so i'm pretty proud of it you know i was just like hacking away at the back and yeah it's pretty uneven but um you know given that i'm not trained or anything <laughs> i'm pretty pleased with it so Anyway, I hope you will read This Is Not My Hat and I hope you will recommend to me your favorite books from the 21st century so that I can also get new wonderful favorites um, that were written within my lifetime that I can go back to again and again, just like I do with this book. So uh, without further ado, I will see you in the next video. Bye bye.